I'm Malcolm Duncan, and I'm thrilled that the Big Church Read is including Flipped Life in the Upside Down Kingdom, my latest book, as part of their project. And I just want to say how much I appreciate the Big Church Read and the fact that it is encouraging us to read books and to study them and reflect on them and to allow their message to impact our lives. I hope you're enjoying the book, Flipped Life in the Upside Down Kingdom, and I hope it's helping you and inspiring you. We've looked at the purpose of the kingdom. We've looked at the people of the kingdom. We've looked at the um, values of the kingdom, the foundations of the kingdom. And today, for a few moments in this video, I want to look at the people of the kingdom, you and me. In a world that says chase popularity, Jesus says, welcome everybody. In the Beatitudes, particularly the Beatitude that's recorded in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, and the Beatitude that's recorded in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, the bookends of the Beatitudes, we read a promise about the kingdom of heaven. We read these words, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, in verse 3. And we read in verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That promise is the only one that is repeated across the Beatitudes. And I think it's important because it gives us a cycle, a picture of what it means to be God's people, to live in dependency on him. And the great reward for us is that we are God's people and the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as us. It is given as a gift to those who will follow him. The people of the kingdom learn to see the world through child's eyes. When I was 18, I went and lived for a while in Mexico, volunteering in an orphanage called Sparrow's Gate. And I met a young boy there called Paolo, who became almost like dependent on me in a good way, not in a bad way. And I learned the joy of life through his eyes. We lived for all the time that I was there on glasses of water and refried beans. And Paolo had been abandoned in a car and ended up at the ranch. But he didn't need anything. He just lived in dependency and joy and thankfulness for friends and for people around him and for being part of a community. Jesus invites us to such a life of freedom, dependence, abandonment, simplicity, grace, and hope. And it's powerfully demonstrated to us in the Sermon on the Mount, which is recorded in Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. Don Carson, the American theologian and pastor, says this, The more I read these three chapters about the Sermon on the Mount, the more I am both drawn to them and shamed by them. Their brilliant light draws me like a moth to a spotlight, but the light is so bright that it sears and burns. No room is left for forms of piety which are nothing more than veneer and sham. Perfection is demanded. That's because in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. It's a call to be exactly formed, not to have everything right, but to be exactly formed as God wants us to be formed. Scott McKnight describes the Sermon on the Mount as the moral portrait of Jesus. And if in my last video we were looking at the virtues of the king, then we as his people must reflect those virtues into the world. Where do we find those virtues? Here in Matthew 5, 6 and 7 in the moral portrait of the king. Commenting on the fourth beatitude, which says, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the famous occupant of the Westminster Chapel pulpit said, I do not know of a better test than that anyone can apply to himself or herself in this whole matter of the Christian profession than a verse like this. If this verse to you is one of the most blessed statements of the whole of Scripture, you can be quite certain you are a Christian. If it is not, then you had better examine the foundations again. The call to be dependent on Jesus, to reflect Jesus, to show Jesus to the world as people of the kingdom, that comes above our ecclesiology, above all of the secondary issues. If we are people of the kingdom, then we reflect the king. The Jewish rabbi, Pinchas Lapid, commenting on the Sermon on the Mount, says we must be careful not to demote it and domesticate it. 
in one of his books on the subject, he says, in fact, the history of the impact of the Sermon on the Mount can largely be described in terms of an attempt to, to domesticate everything in it that is shocking, demanding, and uncompromising, and to render it harmless. Dietrich Bonhoeffer described Matthew 5, 6, and 7 as a charter for life. I encourage you to read it, to take 20 minutes or half an hour and read it, to read it slowly, to allow it to penetrate your heart. In it, you will discover Jesus at the center of the community in Matthew 5. You'll see him inviting us into a different life in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, 3 through to 11. You'll see him reminding us that our light and our presence in the world can change things in Matthew 5, 13 through to 16. In Matthew 5, 17 to 20, you'll hear him say, I haven't come to abolish the law, I've come to fulfill it. In Matthew 5, 21 to 48, you'll see him reinterpreting and advancing and expanding the Jewish understanding of the Torah and the law as he says, I am the law, as he addresses key issues like relationships, words, retaliation, lust, longing, marriage, faithfulness. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, you hear him saying, be perfect then as I am perfect. One of the key challenges, be mature, be perfectly formed. In Matthew 6, Jesus turns his attention to our inner life. He asks us to think about uh, the three great pillars of Judaism and the pillars of Christian faith, giving, fasting, and praying. And he reminds us that these are not to be done for the audience, but for God alone. Then he links that to the way in which we handle stuff and material possessions. And he reminds us that worry and possessions and materialism is not combated by garnering more stuff, but by having a better attitude in our hearts. And he tells us that we are to seek God's kingdom first and his righteousness and everything else will be added to us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Then in Matthew chapter 7, he challenges us in our relationships with other people. And he tells us as people of the kingdom, we are make, to make sure that we do not judge other people more harshly than we expect God to judge ourselves. And he reminds us that we can test our spirituality through three simple lessons at the end of Matthew chapter 7. He says we can test ourselves by whether we are going on a narrow road or a broad road, by whether our fruit is being produced in our lives, and by what is left when storms hit us. And he says in Matthew 7, 12, and do unto others as you would have them do unto you, the golden rule. The Sermon on the Mount is full of practical advice for what it means to be the people of God. It is relevant, it is challenging, it is demanding, and it is authoritative. At the end of the sermon, we're told that the people that were listening to Jesus took note that he spoke with authority. And then in Matthew 8, 9, and 10, and I didn't get a chance to put all of this in the book, we see how far that authority goes as Jesus heals somebody in the Jewish community, then in the Roman community, the next step out. Then he um, delivers somebody of a, a demon, the next step out. Then he, um, then he uh, calms a storm. And it's as if Matthew is saying, you want to know how far the authority of a life lived in Jesus goes? How far the authority of this man goes? It goes to the edge of the universe. It goes to the creation. It goes across time and history and space, and it has the power to defeat evil. The people of the kingdom have a powerful commission, but we are called to a life of faithfulness, a life that is reflected in the Sermon on the Mount.